is Pat Blair, and I have been a choreographer for, well, let's see, I don't think we can count the years where I was in high school, but where I first found choreography, so that's where it all started. And I just was always drawn to it. I was drawn to a lot of artwork, though, watercolor illustration, but very intrigued by letter forms. And so, put that aside, life went on, graduated from college, had a job, but I was always interested in calligraphy. I never left my head. And I remember um, talking to my neighbor one day, and she said, oh, I have a bar mitzvah coming up. She said, I'm looking for a choreographer. And I said, oh, I used to do calligraphy. Maybe I can help you out. And I did. I remembered enough about it. But as I did that, I realized where I thought I had a lot of skill, I really found that I, I kind of need to, to know a little bit more. I, I needed to pursue this. I realized I, I'm rediscovering it. And I decided I really had like to um, go further with it and learn some more. So I found local classes. And I just ate it up. I found as many workshops as I could in any kind of calligraphy there was. And I was just avarice for all this, this kind of um, work. And life happened, and I was forced to look for employment. Long story short, um, my husband lost his job because of an accident. So he was out of work, so I'm thinking, OK, um, do I go back to school and pursue a, a master's or do I try my hand at calligraphy? And I try my hand at calligraphy and I said, I'm going to make this work. And I spent, I guess, a few years just developing, uh, I had the passion, I guess I just developed the um, skill in business, you know, marketing and that type of thing. But, Quickly, it developed into a pretty steady job, which now I look back and I think, how lucky was I, you know, to have that? Not only to fall back on, but um, to to have something that I absolutely love to do and still make a financial make financial progress with it. You know, because not everybody does. So anyway, long story short, that turned into 20 years of a freelance business. This is in New York, and it was pretty robust. Um, I have to say it was, it, was a, it was an income. It was like the three kids from college, but loving every minute of it, you know, able to make my own time, but um, still, of course, having a schedule, but a little bit more flexibility. So that was that. I guess it was in the middle of the 90s. Um, my husband did receive his job back. This is after 10 years of bad work. Did receive his job back. And, but we had to move to Virginia. So OK, we went to Virginia and um, pursued my freelance and then developed a freelance following in Virginia. And, um, your name gets passed around, you start to know people, and in Washington, D.C. area, I wasn't too far from Washington, D.C., the um, party scene, of course, was I mean, crazy. Everyone's having parties. You know, all different political sides are, are having parties, and they all need a calligrapher. So at that point, my name had been passed around, so now I was starting to be involved with these kind of parties. I also learned the protocol of Washington. And so, um, I guess I did a freelance um, in, in Washington, I guess about eight or nine years. And then one day I got a call from the social secretary at the White House, and I had been working with her for a few years, and she called me and she said, well, um, the director of the calligraphy office at the time uh, just left the position, she said, would you be interested in it? Chief calligrapher at the White House. I didn't hesitate. I said, well, absolutely. You know, what kind of experience I, I, I would like to do that. So that turned into a 12-year um, uh, stint at 
the uh, White House. And I was chief political, so what we had to do, of course we did calligraphy, but we also, well, we had to know all different kinds of calligraphies, because depending on the event, we needed to choose hand, would copper plate work, would um, metallic work, would Spencerian work. So part of our job was to kind of match the tone of the event with calligraphy, which was um, amazingly interesting, you know, to kind of put a um, personality to a calligraphic hand. I mean, that's what we do, right? Calligraphy communicates. Calligraphy communicates, though, aesthetically. So we want our readers to enjoy what they're reading, know what they're reading, though. They need to be able to uh, be able to read it. So for an invitation, they need to know where they're going and what time to be there. But it's the aesthetics of it. So anyway, that was a fun part of the job for me, to be able to kind of use calligraphy in that kind of very visual and very communicative way. Um, I think that was the fun part. So um, that's kind of my path in my calligraphic journey. A uh, long time, I guess it spans what? 30 something years, 35 years? I feel like an old timer for sure. But, um, but at the same time, you know, it's great to reflect back. And also, I am so enjoying um, meeting newcomers to the field because I can remember myself at my first IAMCA. I can remember exactly where new students are and how they feel and kind of intimidated, kind of excited, kind of nervous. Um, you know, inevitably comparing yourself to others, feeling, oh, I don't know if I can do this, you know, it's, it's clear as, a day, as, as day to me, but pursue it, you know, if, if you love it, just keep at it, pursue it, because it's a passion, and irregardless of your destination, um, not everyone in this is as fortunate in the path as I am. I mean, I wasn't lucky. I just was in the right place at the right time. And to have the experience, you know, working with diplomats and presidents and, um, was extraordinary. But uh, that wasn't my goal. I had no intention of doing that when I started. All I wanted to do was write. And all I wanted to do was learn calligraphy and maybe address envelopes for people and write out cards for people. You know, that's kind of what, where, my, um, where my passion lies. And that's enough. Mm -hmm. That's enough. Hectic, a little stressful. So part of our job, and a lot of this I mean I, I had to do actually as a freelance calligraphy. So backtrack a little to a freelance calligraphy, what can you expect from that? Um, I mainly did calligraphy for social events, so addressing envelopes, doing place cards, designing invitations, which I love because everyone's working with happy events, so it's always a fun time. The calligraphy office in the White House did all those things too, but then we also, um, well, I like to think, I, I like to say we took care of everything that had any writing on it. So, you know, not only social invitations and place cards, we would do certificates and testimonials. Um, we, like I said, had to know many hands because sometimes copper plate was a perfect choice, sometimes not. You know, we worked with um, lunches, they were called working lunches, where invited diplomats from other countries met with our diplomats. So about 20 people, but this was not a social event, it was definitely a um, kind of a work event. So you don't want anything as flowery as copper plate, right? you want something a little bit more sedate, a little bit um, more um, readable. So we would choose italic or unchill or, or something like that. So that was the fun part of it as well. 
was uh, a lot more than all that. We, well, we had to be very knowledgeable about computer because we were then in the digital age, we had to know how to scan our artwork, the resolution, um, how to prepare it to print, how to send it to the printer, all of those things. Usually the turnaround was maybe as short as a day. So we had to make sure that what we said to the printer was spot on correct. Uh, there was really no time for, for back and forth. Um, so that was a big part of the job. We also took care of publishing tour books and brochures. So we needed to know InDesign, we needed to know Illustrator. Um, I worked with a huge printmaking company. We, um, published 60,000 tour books every Christmas. So I did that. I had to arrange the artwork and the text for that. Work with the printer. Um, we did a big signage. We would hand paint eight foot long plywood boards to become like photo ops for picnics and things like that. So we had um, hand painting you know, with a, a huge paintbrush and acrylic paint to, to paint these huge plywood boards with lettering. My aunt, so we had lettering, but that would have been more drawn lettering. So you name it, you know, like I said, anything with a word on it, they came to us for. Cards, notes, um, birthday cards, you know, things, things like that. We also know, had to know protocols. So when you are writing anything for Anyone in, in the diplomatic circle who had a title we had to know the correct forms of address. Forms of address uh, we received from the State Department. So before any um, president or prime minister came to visit the White House, we would need to, to receive the correct forms of address from the State Department. And um, traditions of the visiting country were to be considered too. Um, Various countries have sensitive colors and flowers. You know, all these things may have a meaning to another country that the United States doesn't necessarily have. So we had to make sure that we were aware of that, you know, and you know, the last thing we want to do is offend to visit any country. Even if it's an error, um, we still want to make sure it doesn't happen. So, so knowledge of protocol, forms of address were really, really important. So that was a big part of it as well. Um, there were a lot of challenges. Well, I think every project is, is challenging in, in the way that um, we always had a deadline. And we always had a plan A on how to get to that deadline, but then we had to have a plan B and a plan C because there were nothing ever goes to plan when we wanted to go to plan. We've had some interesting experiences though, and I think um, a few of them come to mind. Um, I think my favorite experience was I worked with the first lady. So I worked with um, three presidents. I worked with President Clinton, but as a part-timer, but then came on full-time with President Bush, and then worked with President Obama and President Trump. And I have a lot of very favorite memories. A few of them stick out, though. One of them was when uh, Laura Bush came into the office one day, and she chatted with me directly, because I was the director kind of representing our office, and she said, Pat, I'd, I'd like your help. Um, I'm interested in creating a design for us in China, and I want it to look like China that President Madison used. So we went down to the China room. There is such a thing. All the uh, the, uh, the place settings for the presidents are displayed there, and we looked at the president at China from President Madison, and it was kind of a basket weave pattern, but. It was um, hand dyed. You could see that it was hand dyed. But she loved it. And she said, This is what I have in mind. And I said, 
okay, you know, you, know, you always said you could try to do it, you know, you never said I can't. We, we can try, yellow, we'll try anything. So I said, yeah, let's see what we can do. So she showed me what she had done already. And this, I love this story because it really goes to the importance of calligraphy, I think, and the, um, the feel of a person's hand in artwork. To be able to see uh, the human touch in artwork, I think, is very special. So she showed me what she had already, and she had worked with um, Lendix China Company, and they had developed a pattern, of, a basket weave pattern for her, but they did it by computer. Beautiful basket weave pattern, perfect. But she showed it to me, she says, Pat, there's no life here. It's, it's very sterile, it's very static, it was perfect. But there was no life. She said, when you look at the mattice in China and compare it to the computer generated China, it was like night and day. She says, the mattice, and this is what I'm looking for. So I said, I agree with you. And I, I really appreciated her noticing that because you know, most people would see the basket we it's, it's, it's fine, but it was, it was missing that, that quality, kind of like the difference between hand calligraphy and typography, same kind of thing. So, got to work, um, long story short, about an, a year and a half later, we developed a basket weave pattern, and you can look it up, you can look push China, you can see it. Um, we developed it, it was all done by hand. Um, I did generate the, uh, the points of contact, so, so it was basically uh, the rim of the, of the China was basket loop. So each, each curve kind of started with a point A to a point B, all around the plate. So those dots I did generate by computer in InDesign because I wanted them evenly spaced. From then on, from there on it was end up. So, so what I did is I first um, I, I took a, a red Solo cup, a plastic of a red Solo cup, and I cut out a curve. And then I went around the, um, the rim on paper and connected all the dots with pencil using the template. Once that was all done, and a basket weave pattern had two, two uh, curves, one this way and this way, all the way around. So I did that again, going in the other direction. Then once that was done, all in pencil, I took a pointed pen, a pointed pen and, and black ink, and then went from point to point, but with no template, just by hand. So I had the pencil underneath, but I had the pen tracing the pencil. So I had I had the line work there, but it wasn't exact, of course, because you're doing it by hand, so it wasn't exact. But just what she wanted. It was just what she wanted. And then everywhere that those lines crossed, I added a little tick mark, just as the Madison China had. And those tick marks were also not perfect. They, they were consistent. Kind of like Spencerian, they, they were consistent, but they weren't all perfect, but um, it just worked out. It just worked out. And so, um, I like to call it like perfectly imperfect, you know. It's, it's just, it's skilled, it's consistent. At first glance, you see this pattern, but um, it just gives such a lovely texture that you can, you can just, it's just more lively than something done like that. So that, I think that's my favorite experience, you know. I think first of all because, my gosh, you know, what an honor to work on something like this. It's going to be used forever. But also, secondly, it just, it just brought it all together for me that, you know, anything that the hand touches is just quite so, so unique. You know? And it, it just goes to validate what we're all knowing. I have enjoyed it immensely. I, I miss the energy in that job. I don't miss the pressure so much. It, it was exhilarating. 
for sure. But I think every job, no matter how much people love a job, you get to a point where I just want to do something different. And I was at retirement age, I put in a lot of time in the community, so I wanted to do other things. More at a slower pace, I think, would be the big difference. And so I still keep my hand in the community, mainly with teaching. So I've been teaching since, gosh, the 90s, I think. I've done workshops, in-person workshops. But, um, of course, that all stopped. So I'm still doing that online. Uh, In-person workshops are starting up again, I think, so uh, they'll resume. But I've done those for decades, and I really, that's where I, I love to, to talk to people, talk to new students, and now this new generation that's coming up, you know, trying to share what I know in all those years with them. And just so it doesn't die, you know, just so it kind of can keep going. And all that knowledge that someone like me has, has accumulated with all of that time, all of those experiences can, can carry on, you know, so, so it's important. And I know there are a lot of people out there who are like me that are liking lettering. They don't know why, they're just kind of drawn to it and um, don't know where to go. Okay, what would I do with this? You know, uh, my parents would say, oh, what can you do? With I've always loved artwork, but what can you do with artwork? You know, you're not going to be able to make a living. And this is going back a long time when that was thinking, especially with women. And, you know, she says, well, go be a teacher. Be a teacher. And, uh, I have my teacher, well, I had done that even when I was at the White House. I did not stop that. I remember I would travel to the West Coast, uh, leave on a, a Friday late afternoon, travel to the West Coast, teach Saturday, Sunday, Sunday night, take the red eye back to Washington, get in Washington about 7 a.m., wash my face, brush my teeth, and go to work. And that's how I fit it all in. Well, I'm older now. I don't know if I could do that that, that much anymore. But um, but I really do. I, I do like the the part about still teaching. I, I, I really do it because I do I do enjoy everything. But I think my favorite hand is pocket play or in grocery script. They're they're similar. They're not alike. Um, Copper plate is from the European tradition, and uh, Engrosser script is the Americanized version of that. So Engrosser script is a little bit more sedate, um, a few more breaks in the, in the pen movement, where copper plate is a little bit more, very bit, small bit, but a little bit more um, joint. But I just love it. I, I love the feel of the, the pen. And it's interesting, when I first studied clear through, the very first hand I was taught was italic, and that was in high school. And I still have those sheets from high school. And we, we learned italic with a large nib, and um, kind of like we did with Missouri the other day, where you work larger than your end will work. But it, it shows you, the, you know, the, the, the path of the pen and, and the structure of the forms. And that's how I learned italic. Um, but I remember when I was in, you had to apply to get into the art club in high school. Which seems weird to me now, but I guess they wanted to make sure that you really were somewhat interested in art work, right? They weren't judging by any means, you weren't, but they needed to, I guess they wanted you to see um, that you really were interested. Um, but my submission for that was a page of black letter. I'd never been taught black letter. I copied it from a book, but that was how much I loved lettering, that I would take this book that um, I had one, one book with all different kind of letters, and I would take that book and I would look at every page and try to copy every page. And like you were saying, I, you know, you start out self-taught, you teach yourself. I didn't know anybody to teach me that. But you're looking, you're observing, and all that is taken, it's taken effect. 
you know, you're, you're kind of teaching yourself some letter structure. And then later on, of course, I found out that you know, in-person instruction is, whether in person or now on Zoom, is really helpful because you get the um, perspective of the teacher and you, you learn the movements, you, you see the movements, you can't possibly see that when you're looking in the book, but you see the movements. Once you hear the instructor and, and you kind of get in their head. And I remember when I was in my days of taking as many workshops as I could, I would look for instructors, of course, but I had to like what they did, you know. Um, there's all different kind of clear for me, and they were some I were drawn to more than others, and those are the ones that I set out to learn. Well, how did he do that? I mean, what was he thinking? What is his perception of this? And, and so that's how I sought out my instructors, because there's so much more to it than looking at letters on a page. I mean, that's a great start, but then you need to go further into it. Um, I mostly teach point and pen, so copper plate, engrosser script, all different kind of flourishing, um, illustrative flourishing, so kind of standalone flourishing, um, italic, uh, a little bit of unsure, but mostly italic I think is a black hand. Uh, Spencerian of course, and layout and design, all different kinds painting, I've recently gotten into watercolor painting, so I do, I do a lot of wedge brush painting. Um, gosh, I, I kind of draw upon all my experiences and I think of everything that I needed to do throughout that time and I can tell you how to do it, you know, so, um, so, so really anything within that realm, but my, my favorites, I would say, you know, my heart really runs on would be the pointed pen, the flourishing, the light strokes like the sincere we did yesterday, you know, learning how to use those tools, learning how to just kind of make it sing, make your letters just kind of dance off the page. And then accompanied by illustrative things um, like singular, um, what they're called cartouches or illustrations, and of course floral painting or anything of that sort. So um, it's all fun. Yes, I'd love everyone to visit my website. It's patplayercalligraphy.com. And on that website, I do have some pieces from the White House and some other uh, invitation kind of things. A lot of projects that I did as a freelancer and in the White House that kind of shows what I did with calligraphy in my, in my job. And, uh, and then I do, I keep current on my website with workshops, and they're pretty much ongoing. I'm retired, so you know, it, it's, it's easy for me to carve out some time for workshops. They're, they're short, they're two hours, plus one day or two days, but, um, and all recorded. So I love it because I'm still able to and I talk nonstop, just like here. I just talk nonstop. And, you know, all these thoughts and all these impressions and all these experiences just kind of come, come rolling out. Um, and then they're recorded. So, because I talk so much, people can kind of pause <laughs> and say, well, let me see you do that again. And it's really been a great tool, you know, for students learning. And, of course, reaching all over the world, I, I always um, kind of ask, especially for larger classes, I, I, first of all, I can't believe that we're talk, I'm talking to people all over the world, but I always ask, and, and inevitably, uh, I have lots of students from Hong Kong, and, and then we have Europe and France and uh, Brazil, you know, and all over the world, and it's incredible how we can reach out these days. It's, it's just a real, really lucky that we have this opportunity to learn from people all over the world and um, definitely need to take advantage of that. You know, there's a lot to learn 
and uh, and it's out there. So uh, so hopefully we'll connect again. Thank you.